Great. Well, welcome uh, to Connecticut Arts Alliance's Create the Vote Candidate Forum. Uh, this is hosted today by Northwest Connecticut Arts Council and for and the Arts and Culture Collaborative of Waterbury Region. Um, I'm Eric Dillner. I'm the CEO of the Shoreline Arts Alliance, as well as a board member of the Connecticut Arts Alliance. We've come together as local arts agencies from across the state to provide candidate forum forums to help inform our voters on your position on supporting the arts. Thank you for, uh, for being a, uh, willing to join us today as a candidate and uh, participating. Um, just so you know, we are recording this uh, today so that um, we can share this out to um, many folks who weren't able to come. So uh, uh, though you may, uh, may or may not know how many folks are out here watching this very moment, believe me, this is, we're gonna spread this out around. So we so much appreciate all the time that you're taking here. And welcome to all our guests. Thanks for being here. Just a little bit of housekeeping. We will um, use the Q&A for uh, asking your questions of the candidates and our moderators will feed the questions uh, to the candidates as, uh, as they see they're, they're able to during the conversation. Uh, we do have some stock questions that'll, that'll happen right along. Um, if your question is directed to a specific, specific candidate, uh, please let us know that. If not, we'll just assume that it's a, a general question for all to, to answer. So again, today is about the arts, leveraging the economic impact on our communities in the state, and uh, as well as coming together to improve this great state of Connecticut. So uh, without any further ado, uh, I would like to introduce Steph Burr, the Executive Director of Northwest Connecticut Arts Council. Steph? Thank you so much, Eric. And I just wanna say thank you so much to Shoreline Arts Alliance for um, hosting today, letting us use your Zoom. Uh, it's been very helpful. It's um, our pleasure, our pleasure. So the Northwest Connecticut Arts Council is a 501c3 nonprofit organization we serve artists and arts lovers in 25 towns in and around Litchfield County. And um, co-hosting with me today is Diane Plock, who is the director of the Arts and Culture Collaborative of the Waterbury Region. Hi, thank you everybody for being here. Um, we cover 16 towns in and around the Waterbury Region and the Naugatuck Valley. And our four pillars of service are to promote, connect, collaborate, and advocate for the arts. And advocating for the arts is what it's all about today. So we're gonna move back. Um, I'm gonna throw it back to Steph and she's gonna do a little more introduction. Yep, so um, like Shoreline and the Arts and Culture Collaborative, we're one of nine uh, designated regional service organizations for the Connecticut Office of the Arts. And this program was developed by the Connecticut Arts Alliance, which is a statewide nonprofit organization that works to build political, financial, and grassroots support to ensure that the arts are a vital part of everyone's life in Connecticut. Um, I wanna thank everyone so much for being here today. Um, Create the Vote is a nonpartisan public education campaign to raise awareness and support for the arts amongst voters and candidates running for public office. During this forum, the candidates will be asked about their support for the arts with respect to the economy, quality of life, and recovery from the pandemic. You all set? Yep, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Okay, um, I'm going to, we're going to do the introductions of our six candidates. So here's how that will work. I will call on each candidate. And if each candidate would simply um, restate your name the position you're running for, and what district, and what towns you cover, please. And I will go in no particular order, um, probably what's on the screen here, so I make sure I don't miss anybody. So I'm going to start with John Piscopo. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for having us, appreciate it. John Piscopo, I'm running for the 76th district, um, another term in the 76th district, which covers Thomaston, Northfield, part of Litchfield, Harwinton, Burlington, and uh, happy to be here. Thank you very much. Okay, Michelle. Good afternoon, Diane. Uh, my name is Michelle Zahmer. I'm a first time candidate for state representative in the 69th district of the state house. And 
Uh, my district includes Southbury, and the majority of the town of Southbury, uh, the little tiny town of Bridgewater, uh, as well as Roxbury and Washington. And thank you for uh, convening this event today. I'm very happy to be here. Okay, thank you. Like your background. <laughs> <laughs> nice to be outside, beautiful day. Yeah. Okay, next on my screen is Jeff Damaris. Hi everybody, hi Diane, thank you. Uh, thank you, Eric and Steph. Um, my name is Jeff Damaris, I'm running for the uh, State Senate for the 32nd District, the Democratic candidate. Uh, the State Senate uh, 32nd District is Bridgewater, Bethlehem, Roxbury, Watertown, Washington, uh, Woodbury, Southbury, Oxford, Seymour, and Middlebury. Thank you. And next up is Ron Napoli, Jr. Good afternoon, Diane. Thanks for having me today. It's an honor to be here. Um, I'm running for my second term in the state legislature and I represent the 73rd district here in Waterbury. Thank you. And next up is Eric Berthel. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Diane, Steph, Eric, for putting this together. Um, I am uh, Eric Berthel. I'm running for my uh, fourth term in the legislature representing the 32nd Senate, uh, Bethlehem, Bridgewater, Middlebury, Oxford, Roxbury, Seymour, Southbury, Washington, Watertown, and Woodbury. Thank you. And Maria. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much to uh, Diane and Steph and Eric for organizing this. I'm, it's an honor to be with you all. I am Maria Horn, and I represent the 64th District, and I'm running for re-election. The 64th District includes Salisbury, Sharon, Kent, Cornwall, Norfolk, North Canaan, Falls Village, part of Goshen, and part of Torrington. Um, I think that's it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you all. And I just want to comment that we selected um, a certain number of candidates and invited them. And a lot of that was based on whether the candidates answered our create the vote questionnaire. So the mix of candidates, whether Democrat, Republican has no reflection on our on our leanings or anything like that, where this is a nonpartisan thing, and we just try to get a good representation across our two regions um, without having too many people on the call. So um, I think we are ready um, to move into our first question. And I just have to do a little shout out to see if Lynette. Leslie Piambo is on the call. Um, she is traveling and is, was willing to do the first question, but I was afraid she might not have access. So I think we will call on our backup questioner, and that is Jessica Gaddis from Shakespeareans Productions. She is the general manager there and an actor. So Jessica is going to pose the first question and we're gonna ask each of the candidates to try to limit your answer to about 90 seconds. You don't have to actually time it, but just to give you a sense of a pretty short answer and so that everybody has a chance to answer. Um, and somebody can jump in to start and then we'll just try to make sure all six of you get the opportunity to answer. So Jessica, if you're ready, take it away. The pandemic has been challenging for so many in Connecticut and in so many ways. How have you personally benefited from the arts or creative expression in the last few months? And what local arts experiences have you missed most during the shutdown? I'm happy to hop in if no one else will. I'm sure, actually, I'm sure all of my colleagues have things to say. So um, I will say that for me, what sort of um, unwinds me at the end of uh, crazy and overcommitted days are a return to um, fiction and poetry, which were central in my own uh, collegiate experience and have remained a, a um, mainstay for me throughout because I think it helps to, you know, it, it, it helps create common ground and, and tell universal stories and connect us to something bigger than ourselves. I will say the thing I miss most is live theater 
being with other people, you know, being together, experiencing art um, in a communal environment. I think I very much look forward to the day when we can continue to do that. Thank you. Jessica, I'll say that for me personally, um, music has kept me going. I, I sit in the car in a stressful ride. I have a long ride to my office sometimes. Um, and uh, so I listen to the Beatles a lot. And it's always good for the soul to listen to them. Um, just, but just listening to any kind of music has been something that's been a relief. And, and I also like to read. I was reading Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which is a hilarious book. And it's always good to... It's always good when things are uh, crazy, particularly with the pandemic, to kind of have that uh, a nice uh, a nice laugh. Um, as far as what I've missed the most, I, I've missed going to the movies. I've missed um, going to you know maybe going to a concert, see some see somebody play. Um, I really wish we could do some of that stuff. Thank you. Somebody else. I'll, I'll chime in. I, I uh, well, I was going crazy there for a while uh, getting. Uh, cabin fever during during this uh, shutdown, but I miss the plays at, at the Opera House. I, I volunteer at the Opera House from time to time. I'm I'm a usher there sometimes, and and uh, I was a faithful goer to the plays. We we've had a running set of shows for um, about eight years now, and uh, and we we were doing quite well. And every year we manage to run in the black, which is rare for a, a, a community theater. But uh, we were doing quite well, and uh, and we were. We were on the verge of a great season. We uh, we were we had a play, uh, Steinbeck's of, of Mice and Men, award-winning show going right in the middle. People were starting. The, the house was packed every night, full, sold-out shows, and we had to stop it right in the middle of that show. We were on a real run here, and uh, and it really hurt to uh, to lose those uh, community theater. And it was uh, it, it's really a top shelf organization. So. Really miss that. Since then, uh, you know, doing what I can to get out. Uh, Torrington had a real creative thing with a, what they call it rooftop music or something like that. Uh, Pat and I went to, my wife Pat and I attended, and it was just such a great break to see. And it was that was early spring, and uh, there was music around Torrington. You could walk around, and there was vendors, and it was uh, very, very well done. So it got, got us out. You know, it was very, very important to get out. So I'm looking forward to. Uh, this opening up. I'll go next. Um, Jessica, I think that I share some of the same sentiments that uh, my colleagues have expressed as well. Um, I am also an avid reader and have found that um, because I have two uh, teenage boys who are in high school that I can actually re-enjoy some of the classics that I enjoyed when I was their age um, and um, actually perhaps be a little bit uh, inspirational when they're trying to get through some of the, uh, the odder stuff that they may have to uh, endure as high school students. Uh, but I think that for me, what I've missed the most is uh, being able to uh, visit uh, places like the Mattituck Museum, which of course we know is in its own state of, uh, of change right now. Uh, but also as has been just mentioned by uh, Representative Piscopo, uh, live performances. We have so many uh, great small theaters throughout this part of Connecticut and, and even, even beyond, you know, a, a short reach. Uh, you can go across Connecticut and find places to go and enjoy live performances. And the absence of that is, uh, um, is difficult. And I, and I know I'm not alone with that. Good. And, and oh, go ahead. Michelle, are you ready to go? Yeah, I would love to. Um, I'm actually going to do a screen share. Can everybody see my garden? Yes. Okay, so, so that's how I've kept my sanity this year. Um, as um, two years ago, if you all remember, there was a tornado on May 18th. Um, and that tornado just about destroyed my yard. Um, but what it did do was create sun. And um, I know not everyone considers gardening art, uh, but for me, it's very much an aesthetic experience, uh, more than a science um, experience. So I, um, I have spent a lot of hours out there um, this year, um, you know, cultivating the, this new sunny hill of mine, um, which is, is giant actually. Um, and 
you know, bringing a real aesthetic sense to, to this isolation that we're all experiencing this year. So um, yeah, it's been good. Thank you. And Ron, I think we need to hear from you. Thank you. Thanks, Jess. Thanks for the question. And thanks for the good work that all of you guys do over at Shakespeareance. So during the pandemic, like my colleagues, uh, you know, I enjoy doing a lot of reading. And I'm also a, a high school history teacher. And I've noticed for years that my students love reading the Harry Potter series. And I started reading it and my wife laughs at me and I was, I was hooked. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and what I re uh, miss the most is we were so looking forward to Bruce Springsteen uh, touring again this year. And the fact that he can't because of the pandemic, uh, that's what I miss the most is going to a Bruce Springsteen concert with my family and just enjoying each other's company. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for giving those personal touches um, with your connections with the arts. So we're going to move to question number two, and that's going to be asked by Carl Rosa, who is the executive director of Main Street Waterbury. And he is a longtime member of the Arts and Culture Collaborative for the Waterbury region. And he's a hobby musician, I guess you might say. So Carl's going to ask question number two. Thank you, Diane. Um, well, this is the economic development and economic recovery uh, question. And um, I'd like to start off by thanking the candidates for being part of this today. And uh, uh, this is we, we feel this is so important to, to the future growth of our, our state as well. So the question is... Connecticut can't recover without the arts. We know this and art and culture are key for Connecticut's economic recovery. According to several sources, including the Americans for the Arts and the US Bureau of Economic Analysis, creative industries pump 9 billion into the state and account for 3.5% of Connecticut's total economy. Our nonprofit art organizations support 23,000 jobs generates 800 million annually and, a re and returns $7 back in tax revenue for every $1 invested by the state uh, of Connecticut. So those are compelling statistics. So my question is, how will you help harness the power of the arts for Connecticut's economic recovery? So I'd like to go first on this one because I have a two o'clock, uh, I have a 2.30 hard stop, uh, Diane, as I had shared with you uh, prior to this. You know, um, Carl, first of all, thank you for the work that you do and the support uh, of everything Greater Waterbury. Uh, your, your commitment to downtown Waterbury and Main Street Waterbury are so critically important right now as we uh, hopefully turn the corner with our recovery out of uh, the whole COVID-19 pandemic. But you know, I think it, it goes without saying, and it's pretty easy to understand that the legislature should be supporting um, all small businesses, uh, not only uh, restaurants and cafes and, and small retail stores, but the arts as well, because they essentially are part of the small business fabric and part of the economic engine. You know, we know that when, uh, using downtown Waterbury as an example, when the palace has a show, uh, the restaurants are all lit up. If it's a big enough show and a, and a true headliner, uh, the hotel might be full. Um, the parking garages are, are humming. Everything that's going on in downtown for that moment or for those days when that show uh, is, is present at the palace in this one example creates huge economic uh, benefit and boom in that moment in time. And I think that uh, we need to do what we can to support arts so that we in also not only enjoy them as we've all spoken to already, but that we are allowing for uh, the, the secondary and tertiary uh, effect of that with um, the benefits to, to all the other businesses. And uh, that's why this is so critical. That's why it represents, as you just highlighted, so much uh, value and impact on the economy. So uh, I see it as a small business, uh, all of the arts, whether it's a, a single artist or a large, uh, large entertainment troupe, that we have a responsibility to help them get back on their feet as we would any other business. And as a result, we enjoy the, the benefits of that as that happens. Carl, I'd like to say um, it's, it's important to recognize, obviously, the economic impact and something that, of course, that you've spoken to. 
It's also important to remember that there's a social impact as well. It's important for us to invest in our society as a general rule. Um, but when you look at arts and culture, it, it's what defines who we are. It's part of the very essence of the human experience. And so from an economic standpoint, yes, it makes all the sense in the world to, be, to do what we can from a legislative perspective to, uh, to help uh, arts organizations that are struggling, arts groups that are struggling. And on top of that, though, it is beyond just a question about the economics of the situation. It's a question of society as a whole and what we need to, to make sure that we revitalize our very vibrant arts culture in this region. It defines who we are. It says something good about us. It says a lot about us, even when it's trying to say something about our full story, that we understand that there's a, it's important that from an economic standpoint, we need to be able to revitalize these for, for jobs, for the areas in which uh, a lot of these theaters, a lot of these different places are located. But it's also something for the human spirit. We need to know that we can recover. And seeing that, seeing our theaters reopening, seeing our music festivals starting up again. That's important for us to be able to take the next step as a society to know that we're gonna be okay, we're gonna get out of this. So there's an economic impact, but there's a, a overall social impact that is very, very vital to all of this too. And it's incumbent upon us in the legislature to make sure that your organizations have the resources to be able to come back. So I would, combine um, the, uh, the comments of my, my colleagues before me that, that the arts you know, and cultural institutions are not just part of our um, you know, economic life, they are anchor tenants. I spent this morning in um, downtown Torrington with Rufus, who's somewhere here, um, uh, with the governor um, and you know, you know that the central core of Torrington is anchored by the Warner Theater and Five Points Art Gallery. That is what brings people downtown. That is what, where they go to restaurants and bars and do their shopping and, 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 and also uplifts us all and makes us feel like we are a community. I, I was glad to hear from the governor today that he's is going to commit um, $9 million from CARES Act money to the arts. Um, we'll see how that goes because for those institutions, particularly, you know, institutions like the Warner, the performing arts, they can't open at half speed. The math just doesn't work. And so we have to, it is incumbent upon us as, you know, state legislators to the degree we can, but also to push with our federal counterparts to get resources dedicated, grants if possible, to help these institutions bridge the gap between now and when they can reopen fully because otherwise they won't be there for us. And that is going to be a disaster for all of our towns. So we really have to work hard to give them resources. Yeah, if I could add on to Maria, the um, what one of the things that has really interested me in, in, through this pandemic is the opportunities that are coming out of it. And I have seen, I mean, the, some of the artists I know personally, as well as, you know, people I observe online have really innovated the way they deliver their art. Um, they are fine, and, and some of them are expanding um, uh, into new areas of art in order to continue to earn a living uh, in this difficult time. So I think as a state, I'd like to see us really capture and quantify that um, because it's happening in, in, in such a disparate way um, that I'm afraid that the, you know, all the good stuff that's coming out of this difficulty is just you know, it'll just get lost to history once things go back to normal. So um, I would I'd really encourage our arts community to look at that. Hey, Carl, it's Ron. And I want to thank you for the work that you do with Main Street, Waterbury and, and downtown. Um, you know, look, downtown has had in Waterbury a revitalization. And we have proven that when we have important cultural events, people actually show up. So when we have a beer festival or the gathering or the barbecue cook-off, this brings a lot of people into downtown. The people get to appreciate the city where they live. Other people come from different cities. It's a pull factor, so it helps Waterbury. So look, I mean, as a legislator, it's incumbent upon us that we make sure that those resources are there to support the arts. We've got to do that. Thank you. Um, John, did you want to comment on this one? 
Yes, yes, briefly, uh, Carl, thank you. I, I think uh, I would go armed with those studies you cited right off the bat uh, to Hartford and, uh, and just bring that up in every debate. I serve on the Finance Revenue and Bonding Committee. I'm on the Bonding Subcommittee. And I think that's a great source of funding for the arts. And uh, we were successful in getting what we call a good to great grant, which, is, uh, which has been working in Thomas and Opera House has taken advantage of that competitive grant type system. And uh, so uh, I think that's what we do. And, and we just tell them basically what you just told us when you, when you outlined your question. And, and that's, uh, you can't argue with those, those numbers. I mean, it's, it's compelling and, it's a, and it's, a, it's a great incentive for those in government to invest. Uh, I know the, the problem sometimes has been with the arts commissioner in, in with the Department of Economic and Community Development somewhat getting lost in that bureaucracy, if you will. But I think our new commissioner sees this uh, as, as important. And, and that's very, that, I think that's our job as legislators to uh, impress upon the commissioner of economic development to understand the importance of arts and the importance of his deputy commissioner or whatever that position is in that, in, in that department uh, that, they, uh, that they are more assertive and, and heard more. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you all for your answers. Um, I know Eric Berthel has a, a 2.30 commitment. Do you have time for one more question, Eric, or no? Uh, I think I'm, I, I have to be on with my other event at 2.30. So I'm gonna say okay. uh, thank you and, uh, and good day at this point. Thank you again for having me and for the opportunity to say hello. Uh, enjoy the rest of your, uh, your conversation. Thanks, okay. Diane. And for anyone who wants to see the rest of Eric's answers, you can go to um, Connecticut Arts Alliance website. All the candidate questionnaires that we received are there. So you can see the answers um, on, on that website. And that is ctartsalliance.org. So if you'd like to know Eric's other answers to these other questions, you can look up his questionnaire and the questionnaire of any candidate that you might be interested in. Eric, thanks for being here. Thanks. Have a good day. Okay. And I'm going to turn it over to Steph, who will introduce our next person to ask a question. Great. Thank you so much, Diane. Um, so Jock is having a little trouble with his video, but um, we'll see if his audio works. And if not, we can skip him and um, we can go on to the next question for now and then go back to him later. But um, I'd like to introduce Jock Williams, who is a local um, activist. He is a radio show host, a musician, and he's the director of Culture for a Cause here in Torrington. Um, so Jock, take it away, thank you. Okay. Maybe the audio is not working after all. <laughs> Are you there, Jock? All right, I'm gonna try to help Jock troubleshoot, um, but we'll skip his question for now. And we'll go on to the next question, which will be presented by Rufus Duram, who is the executive director of the Warner Theater. Thanks, Steph. Uh, yes, I'm the executive director of Warner Theater here in Torrington, Connecticut. And uh, my question is about um, aid for the arts. I know uh, Maria just touched on um, uh, this a little bit, but uh, essentially 62% of artists uh, across our state are currently unemployed and arts organizations are either unable to reopen or struggling um, because our business models do not necessarily uh, coincide with uh, physical distancing limitations. Um, and the industry really ne does need uh, emergency support to recover and thrive. Um, we've suffered as a whole industry, a sec cultural sector, uh, about $400 million of economic losses so far uh, because of this pandemic. Um, this is personal to me because as you can see in my picture behind me, <laughs> this is what the Horner Theater looks like right now. It's empty. We have 1,800 seats. Um, so my question to the candidates is, will you support uh, emergency funding uh, to support the arts industry in Connecticut? Uh, if so, uh, what sources uh, do you think are available uh, and at what level are you looking at supporting? So thank you for being here and um, 
Yeah. I'm going to jump. I'm going to jump in because um, as things happen and people zoom in and out, I want to let everybody know that Senator George Logan has joined us. He had um, several commitments today. So if you would just introduce yourself, Senator Logan, um, what position you're running for, the towns you cover, and I'll let you take uh, the first stab at this question. Sure. State Senator George Logan uh, representing the 17th uh, Senate District which includes uh, Naugatuck, uh, Bethany, Beacon Falls, Ansonia, Derby, Woodbridge, uh, and Hamden. Uh, I live in Ansonia with my family. Uh, the arts are uh, very important uh, to me. Um, part of my uh, serious hobby is I'm a musician on the side. I uh, play uh, guitar and I have a, a band with my brothers, the bass player, my old college friend. Lots of folks from the uh, community uh, into uh, my home. I have one of those uh, home uh, recording uh, studios. Uh, I mentor uh, uh, kids in the uh, in the area, uh, in the valley, um, uh, particularly. And the music is a great source of uh, inspiring uh, young people uh, to one learn how to achieve a goal and learn discipline. When it comes to the arts themselves, uh, I do uh, believe that it is important and is vital that part of the uh, recovery effort here in Connecticut uh, includes the arts and includes uh, the proper level of funding. Now, I don't know what that level is. Uh, I'm uh, uh, looking to uh, look at information and data um, from folks who are in the know, but make sure that next year, which is a, a biennial budget year, very important session, uh, that I will not be signing on to uh, any uh, budget that doesn't uh, 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 properly address the issue of uh, the arts and helping to sustain them. Whether it's uh, arts in terms of the performance, uh, theaters for, for, uh, for music, uh, for theater, uh, galleries, uh, all of the, uh, the above. Very important because monies that are spent on the arts um, also uh, help to encourage uh, economic growth in the communities that it serves. So the arts are very important to me. Looking forward to continuing with the dialogue and the communication. Uh, I need more data to know what the actual levels are that are needed. dance competitions up there over the years uh many of them and it's a beautiful beautiful theater and um and i've been there to see a show as well um it's just a great great venue and uh, you guys should be proud of that venue it's, it's wonderful up there um in terms of, of what you're talking about the question about you know how to help those you know this pandemic has completely redefined the 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 phrase of uh, starving artists it's, it's now it's, we have a situation where people cannot find uh, the work because of situations beyond their control, because theaters are shut down, because venues are shut down. Um, I think it's just as uh, important to help artists that are in situations like that as it is to help somebody who's lost their job at a manufacturing facility or somebody who's lost their job at a retail uh, store, um, because those are livelihoods. These are people that, that work, they follow their craft, it's something they love to do, but it is their livelihood. And they need to be able to provide for their family just as much as anybody else in any other industry does. And so we have to not look at uh, people in the arts and as, well, they're sort of contractors and that's what they do. No, they're, they're people who have a craft. That craft is vital to the vibrancy of our communities. It is vital to our economy. They have to be able to not only care for their families, but be able to uh, go out and become part of the economy as well. And we want to have them have the opportunities to be able to express themselves and express their art in a proper way. Um, it, it would help places like the Warner Theater. It would help places like uh, even the Watertown Stage, which is uh, which has been trying to open for the last few months here in Watertown. Um, I think it's really important that we do what we can and include artists as part of the unemployment uh, ideas that we're talking about for unemployment relief uh, in the coming session. I'll, I'll just tack on to what I, what I said earlier about this, just to make the, the obvious point that, that Connecticut will need assistance from the federal government. 
And, and there have been bipartisan acts like the Save Our Stages Act at the federal level uh, that would provide um, some financial backing to performing arts venues. Um, but we, all of us, and that includes those of us running for office and those of us in the community and those of us, you know, anybody who has a pen or a voice to press our federal um, legislators to try to make this happen because this is all uh, very theoretical unless we get some assistance from the federal government. Mm -hmm. I'll chime in. Uh, yeah, it's very, very important to, uh, we're, we're hanging out by our fair, fingertips here at the Thompson Opera House also. So uh, yeah, and we're, and we're getting very creative with any fundraising we can do on a lot. And, and without going into the specifics, very drastic spending cuts to, to try and just stay alive here as a, as a community theater. And I'm sure you're doing that too, Rufus, at, at uh, Warner. Uh, it's been tough. I, so I, I know firsthand, I'm on the board at Landmark Community Theater. And uh, so we, like I say, without getting into too, too many specifics, we, uh, we, we, are, we are really cutting drastically. Um, my, my, I think it's great we're having this collaborative because I think our mission has to be to make sure that when we, the, the funds are there, they get distributed fairly. I, I, Sometimes I get a little paranoid that a lot of the funding goes to Hartford, New Haven, Bridgeport, and they don't look out beyond that. Uh, I, I've seen it with, a, with some of the funding from the Fed, federal government, and, uh, and that's somewhat our fault for not inserting ourselves more. Uh, this money seems to be coming in, and there's some formulas created, and it goes out. But So as legislators, I think it's great that we're together, and, uh, and we could kind of fight for uh, a wider vision of where the money should go. Thank you. Yeah, I'll jump in really quick on this too. Look, I mean, this pandemic has really hurt this state. Uh, there, there's almost half a million people who lost their employment and many of them are local artists and they need support so they can continue their craft. Um, I think State Representative Maria Horn hit it right. We really have to lobby our, our federal delegations um, as much as we can and, and you know, to make sure we bring federal resources back, but that aside, I mean, I, I and my, many of my colleagues are committed to make sure that we have resources uh, for the artists who need them. You know, I know that going through unemployment takes some time and it's tedious, but you know, we have to find a way to really get them the resources that they need. Yes, I could, uh, I, I actually want to piggyback on what Jeff Damaris said. You know, I, I've had a, a lot of interest in uh, the, the lives of artists and authors in our state. And um, what I've observed is that a lot of them can't survive on their arts alone. So um, that's certainly a factor in, in right now in, um, in, in this, these desperate times. Um, and whatever we can do to support them, we need to do. Thank you all so much. Um, for your answers to that question. It looks like Jock is with us now. And Jock, thank you for being with us. Like I said, Jock is a communi community activist, musician, um, and leader of Culture for a Cause here in Torrington. Thank you, Jock. It certainly is a pleasure being here with you all this afternoon. And um, I'd like to offer um, greetings to all the distinguished panelists here. Um, and it's reassuring to know that uh, this is just not lip service. Um, John this summer was down here in Torrington for our International Make Music Day and uh, showed his support for what we're doing here in the region and I think that's very important. Uh, and I also appreciate all every the advocation for uh, the artist community and knowing how very important that is and also understanding the challenges that the uh, artist community is, is currently facing. So I wanna thank the Northwest Connecticut Arts Council and STEP for inviting me to, uh, to be a part of this seminar. And uh, it's an hour, uh, I think it's very well invested on my behalf. But the question I have here for you this afternoon um, is this, uh, the pandemic has deepened existing divides in Connecticut, particularly along the lines of race and class. The arts creates shared experiences that can unite people 
and bridge divides to acknowledge the strength in our differences. And my question to you is, do you believe the arts can help build racial and social justice in Connecticut? And if so, how? I'd like to answer that. Thanks, Jock, for, uh, for the question. It's a, it's a really good one, too. It's important, especially today. Um, arts is about the human experience. It's about how we interact with each other. It allows us to learn more about each other, the things that make us the same, the things that are different about us, different cultural backgrounds, different national backgrounds, and things that bind us, things that are common about us, what we all agree on, what we all understand, things that we've all gone through, heartache or sorrow or happiness. It speaks to the human condition. And I think arts is so important, particularly given the divisions we've seen over the last few years to remind us that we're all human, we're all flawed. There are good things in the world. There are bad things in the world. But if we understand what those things are and art brings that understanding out, we have a better sense of not only our communities not only our, our nation and our society, but ourselves as well. And that's one of the great things about people that are, that are artistic is that they find it within themselves. They find the inner person within themselves to express the world, not just as expression of themselves, but to show what human beings have, what they're capable of doing, what's within them. And it shows mm -hmm. us, each of us, a little bit that we're all kind of on the same ride. We're all together. And that's what I think is so important about bringing the arts back. There's an economic portion to it. There's a, there's, there's a financial portion to it, but really what it really speaks to is we need to make sure that we remember who we are. We remember the, the things that bind us together. And that's what I'm hopeful for. That's what I'm hopeful after this pandemic is over and we begin the recovery that we, we remember how important it is to remember the things that bring us together, to, to recognize the good, the bad, and the ugly. And to understand that by recognizing that we learn more about each other and we can live together better. And I think that that's really what arts, the best art does. It makes us realize more about ourselves. I'll share, ah. sorry, am I stepping on somebody else? Um, one of my favorite uh, art projects is the American Mural Project in Winstead, which is this massive uh, mural in an old uh, mill building, um, which is all about the power and dignity of work. And, and going to that and seeing that, especially with school kids, because the founders, uh, Ellen Griesedeck and others, have, have, it's all about kids and involving kids in the creation of the work and also the, you know, participation. And to see kids from all you know, areas of the state and all walks of life come into that space and look up and see in this massive scale, see themselves, see their dad, who's a farmer, who see their mom, who's a firefighter, see people, you know, who've worked throughout their community and to see them portrayed with power and dignity. And they are, you know, it is incredibly diverse in, but in, in every respect of that word. And then to be inv inv invite those kids into the creation of that is a really, to me, always been a really powerful example of, of bringing many people together and everybody is an artist, you know, especially, you know, we know a lot now about, you know, the creativity in little kids that we, our school system sometimes does a really good job of crushing. And, and so to bring small children into that and to harness those that creativity and to have them see this on a huge scale and see how powerful they can be is really important. And then I, on another topic, I just, as a mother, I just want to applaud Michelle for, I also have been there, done that with small kids, having to juggle many things at the same time. I'm very proud that you're doing that and that you're with us and you're showing that you can do everything, if, you know, you can do both at the same time. So I just want to thank you for that. on mute here I'll unmute myself and um, thank you Maria um, yeah one of a couple things about um, on this point um, one is you know when I, I looked I looked at the Mattituck project um, this morning and the last million dollars that they're trying to raise on the renovation and one of the things jumped out that jumped out at me was um, you know that 
the discussion about who would be proud of this project and who would participate in this project. And it kept referring to Waterbarians. And of course, I'm a Southbarian and um, I go to the Mattituck fairly regularly. And, um, you know, on a, just a practical level, I think we have to expand our definitions of who we include in our institutions and, and, and in our, our initiatives. Um, in our community of Southbury, there have been 20 consecutive weeks of um, protests about racial equality and justice. Um, in a town where we have a tiny, tiny little percentage of uh, diversity. Um, so it speaks to the heart of this community that, that um, these uh, majority of white people are, are standing on the corner every Sunday for an hour um, at two o'clock to do this. Um, but it also shows that there's, there are gaps there uh, that we need to bridge. And um, I think we can do it. Um, again, I, the, it's the, the pandemic opportunities um, that, you know, a lot of things have broken down and um, there's a lot of build, a rebuilding um, to do and building anew, I think, um, and reimagining the way that we always did things to maybe include more people than we used to. If I could just jump in on this topic and Jack, thank you for the question. And I think it's very important and appropriate. Um, I, it was President Clinton who once said that our strength is our diversity, right? And I taught an after school program. I teach here in Waterbury in an inner city. And we had an after school theater program. And I saw students so excited about the ability to be on stage and share their talents with each other. And I don't know that there's a better industry at this moment that can bring people together than the arts. So I think it's something that we seriously have to make an investment. And I think it's the one industry, again, that can really heal this country and this state. If I can just interject here, if you guys don't mind, I am so excited about what I'm hearing because I think the vision is organic. Um, it's regional, it's metastasizing. And I know, especially in Torrington, um, it's a concerted effort to focus on artistic development, not only for economical reasons, but for cultural reasons. And I think that that's the best effort that we can put forth in this particular time to, uh, to reinvigorate our society on what made our culture great in the first place. And that was that aspect of our community that embraced artists and let artists uh, do what they do best to bring people together and to communicate messages that will hopefully enlighten uh, as well as entertain us. Thank you so much, Jack, um, for that insight. So we wanna keep on track here because we only have about 10 minutes left. So um, John, would you like to answer that question? Yes, yes, I'll be quick. Um, I think uh, theater and, and the arts in general is, is the definition of diversity. I, you know, I, th I think of the, the plays we have um, are, are in the area. A Diary of Anne Frank was a, a, an amazing play and, and to, to enlighten people on what the Jewish population went through in World War II, the, the, hor the horrors. And, and it, was a, it was a tough play to sit through, but it was compelling. And very important that a lot of school groups came and, and saw that, and, and and plays like that, or even a, a play like Cabaret um, has an undertone of, of people losing their freedoms in it, and and so it's it is the definition of diversity, and, and that should be uh, celebrated. Thank you so much, uh, Senator Logan. Sure, I mean I think uh, certainly uh, the arts are an excellent way to help in terms of. Uh, racial and social justice uh, in Connecticut. In that being, in order to uh, understand the arts, whether it's to perform the arts or to truly appreciate the arts, you need to know a little bit uh, about um, what's the background, what's the cultural um, aspects that created that art, you know, whether it's music, right, whether it's uh, 
uh, blues, right? Southern blues from African Americans, or whether it's uh, salsa or mer merengue. And when you look at those forms of music, for example, guess what? You go back far enough, you end up with, with African roots. A lot of people don't know that. It helps folks understand the rhythms, understand how that music develops, how it was used as a communication tool, for example, during times of, of slavery, uh, or whether it's country music, whether it's uh, theater. Under utilizing the aspect of the arts in terms of the actual pure sense of the music form, creating music or creating, whether it's theater or sculpture, but understanding the background and the cultural uh, sort of um, um, uh, implications, the cultural uh, background, I think is helpful. And when you do that, you find that there's just so much diversity in terms of creating a music or a, an, an art or a, a culture that um, uh, without a doubt, with any form of music, any form of art, involves different people, different time periods, involves history, it involves nations. And it's a great way to bring uh, uh, you know, that together for folks. And it has uh, lots of relevance uh, here today uh, as well. Even here in the, in, the, in the United States, you take a look at how um, American, uh, uh, you know, I say popular music, for example, whether it's uh, uh, you know, rap and, and hip hop uh, and how it all is now melded into the pop uh, world, if you will. That is a, a prime example of how all the different uh, backgrounds and cultures right here in the United States have, have blended, have come together uh, to develop what we have now that which is so special in so many different ways and that the rest of the world, uh, you know, really, uh, uh, you know, pulls onto and has attached to. So music absolutely is a great way for um, bringing to light and bringing people together and dealing with and tackling the issues of, uh, uh, of justice, whether it's social justice, racial justice as well. Thank you so much. Um, so for our last question, uh, I'm excited to introduce uh, Alyssa Archambault, who is a local student here at Northwestern and she is a social justice activist in our community. Thank you so much, Alyssa. So um, my question is regarding, so creativity helps us process loss, fight loneliness, and create vibrant, resilient communities that attract and retain residents, businesses, and visitors. So what do you think is an important role for arts and culture to play in healing, mental health, and rebuilding the social fabric of our cities and towns? I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna rip off something Rufus Duran told me. This is for you, Rufus, which is about, about social prescribing, which is something that I'm looking into, but it is essentially, you know, doctors and medical professionals uh, prescribing, you know, for, for, we are experiencing really an epidemic of uh, a mental health epidemic before the pandemic, which is pandemic, of course, worsened it, but doctors and medical professionals prescribing a trip to the theater, a communal art experience. Um, as a way to treat social isolation, loneliness, um, anxiety, all kinds of things. I think that's really creative and, and I, I hope to uh, someday be part of making that part of what, our, um, what we recommend to everybody in the community. Thanks. Yeah, and this is uh, you know, Senator Logan here. Um, and I would just say, certainly uh, the arts are an excellent way to help people in terms of uh, cope with isolation and loneliness and the balance. Me for one, I've utilized the arts uh, for years for doing that, you know, for me personally, uh, because between uh, you know, being whether it was a high school student trying to get into college or a car college student trying to uh, uh, finish with an engineering uh, degree or trying to find a job or trying to you know, uh, advance in my uh, company and that sort of thing. Uh, you can get kind of caught up in that sort of, uh, you know, uh, education whirlwind or corporate world. And the music always, every day helps me to bring me back and bring that balance. Uh, so I think it's very important. And I think it's important that uh, we uh, utilize the arts and that people uh, understand that uh, it can help more and more people than it is uh, now. And I think that um, it's up to, uh, uh, I will say us in the uh, art uh, community uh, to you know, make that known and to get more people on board and get more advocates uh, because it is um, a way that one, we can help to promote uh, the arts and promote our, our culture, but two, it really does uh, have a, an impact in terms of being able to uh, help uh, uh, people uh, who are, are, are struggling or going through difficult times in their lives. Lisa, I'd like to say, you know, um, 
one thing we can do if we, if we really think about, especially our younger people, um, you know, kids in high school, kids in college, uh, sometimes there's a real feeling of isolation, just normal social isolation that they, that they may feel. And I think it really is important if we as a society, and I think it, from a legislative standpoint as well, encourage artistic uh, development in school and teach to people to find their inner creativity because there are a lot of people, a lot of kids that are, you know, I have kids that are uh, high school, mm -hmm. middle school age, and I know there's a lot of kids that, that have a hard time finding their voice, hard time feeling that they belong. And I think that one thing that can really encourage them is to find that inner self, something that, that, that drives them as a passion. I think encouraging that in school to discover a musical talent or discover an artistic talent, whether it's drawing or painting or acting, something that allows them to come out of their shell, maybe feel like they belong to a larger sense of the community, whether it's a, a, a performing troupe or whether it's a band or something like that, but to give them something to find their inner voice, to give them confidence in themselves. And again, it could be writing, it could be painting. And, and they can also realize that the art that they're bringing to us sustains us. It gives us something. So it, it has, a, it has a, a full effect, a, a circular effect, where if, we are, if we're looking to encourage students in school to find that inner voice, we're helping them and then they, in turn, will help us because they'll give us that spice of life that we so desperately need, especially in times like this. You know, I, I want to jump on that and talk about conflict. Um, of course, we have an awful lot of what, what's so cool about the Zoom is that none of us know who's a Democrat or who's a Republican on here. So we're all getting along really well right now. Um, but for sure. Um, you know, that doesn't always happen. And, and, and Maria, I'm gonna rip off um, Joanne Torty um, from ASAP Arts um, out in Washington, who recently said to me, yeah. one of the things that arts does is it allows us to communicate without confrontation. And that's really a, a powerful use of arts uh, right now. And I think we, we could do more thinking on that and, and how we can deploy that uh, going forward. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Alyssa. Uh, I'll, I'll chime in. Uh, art, art, art therapy has always been just such a great tool in helping all aspects of, of people with suffering from mental, any range of mental illnesses. And, uh, and it should be expanded and, and, and not cut. Uh, I, I was touring a, uh, I, I know I was visiting a uh, assistant, uh, facility, an assisted living facility, and a gentleman came in, volunteer, playing guitar, there was a, you know, and, and, and the, the excitement and, the, and to watch the people engage with this guy was just fabulous, and, uh, and, and it, it drove home the fact that, you know, there's, there's got to be more, more of that kind of thing. Uh, one of my uh, just greatest moments was we would, we would bus uh, people in from, um, facilities, uh, you know, elderly facilities to watch our matinees sometimes at the Opera House, Thomaston Opera House, and Mary Poppins was playing. They, they, they were having a run of Mary Poppins. It was a very positive, upbeat play, as you all know. And uh, to see these people, you never know what their week's like, and you never know what they're going through, but they were, one lady was dancing behind her with her walker on her way out of the theater, with singing one of the songs, and it just, it just, did, did your heart good. It just warmed your heart to see it. It was just, it, was, it just showed the power of theater and, and what it can do for people and, uh, and, and, and music. And it was, it, it's just great uh, to see that. So that, that should, that sh should always be noted. And Alyssa, thank you for the question. Appreciate it. Hey, Alyssa, thank you for the question as well. Look, I mean, the pandemic has had a horrible impact on young people and that kind of gets lost during the conversation. I mentioned earlier how I ran an after school program and, and in that after school program, we actually had at risk students. And when they came into the program, they, it completely changed their world. I mean, when you put them on stage with a spotlight, they wanted to showcase their talents and be part of something bigger than life. So I think if we make that initial investment in students, bring people together so they can showcase their unique talents and, and have diversity be their strength, 
I think that's certainly the way to go and the proper investments to make. Thank you all so much. Um, so we're at three o'clock right now. Um, so if anyone has to jump off, uh, we thank you for being here, but we actually have a really great question in the chat um, that I would like to uh, address. Um, so if you have to go, thank you so much for being here, but um, I'd like to read this question now. I think, um, Steph, yep. um, can we allow Elizabeth to um, ask the question? She oh, sure. Yeah. Is she here? Yep. She okay. is Elizabeth Fisk. I'm right here. Hi. He is um, executive director of a Brass City Ballet and the chairman of the board of the Arts and Culture Collaborative and a member of the Connecticut Arts Alliance. So take it away, Elizabeth. Thank you. I want to thank all of you for being here. This is really informative. And, and um, um, somebody mentioned the human spirit, and it's really good to know that you all are having this um, positive attitude towards the arts. My question to you is we are here asking for your help, but what do you need from us, the artists and the arts organizations to help you make that plea for our cause at the state and federal level and to bring support to us? What do you need from us? Well, Elizabeth, thank you for the question. I think one of the, there's the two points that I'd like to make for, the, for your, my answer for you. The first is as far as helping us uh, basically stand with us, advocate for, for what you guys need what the community need, because uh, we'll get, we're gonna need to have a picture of the full damage from the pandemic. So we're gonna have to see you know, what this all looks like. So part of that is gonna be finding out from the arts community, what do you need? What is it that is, is most required from us? That helps us, that informs the decision making that we can make um, in terms of what we can do. But I think the second part I wanna say is that what you really need to do is do what you're doing as far as being artists is concerned. Showing the value of what art brings to all of us and, and what it means to our society is the best advocation that can be done. It shows that we need all of you. You know, you give us, art is to me, it's, it's the spice of life. It gives life flavor. It gives us something more than just you wake up in the morning, you go to a job and you come home, have dinner and go to bed. It gives us that thing, something to allow us to get through our days, allow us to see something better in ourselves. That type of, that type of thing speaks more than any, anything else. It shows the vital nature of what art brings to us and why it's so important for us to make sure that what we do in Hartford comes back to you so that you can, everybody can get back on their feet. And so for me, that's, those are the two points. Help us understand the scope of the problem. And then secondly, keep doing what you're doing, whether it's as a director of a, of a, a theater community or whether it's as a performer or a writer, keep doing those things too, because that shows us the real vital nature of what you do. Anyone else like to step in and, and take that question? What do you need to, from us? I, I'll step in. Yeah. Go ahead, Maria. Sorry, John. Go, you go no, ahead. No problem. I'll, get... <laughs> <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be quick. I would just say that, the, for example, the Northwest um, you know, uh, Arts Council is a very respected organization and has done a great job lobbying and, and, and sort of bringing viewpoints together and creating data. And I know that, um, you guys are expanding and, and, and I think that's a really good thing too. But I think this organization and all of you together and um, to, you know, as much as possible, you know, as much as this is the arts, you shouldn't be speaking with one voice, but, um, but on, in terms of data and in terms of being able to convey stories about how art has, you know, impacted people's lives is, is valuable to us as we, um, you know, as advocates on your behalf. So I thank you for, for what you have been doing on that front and, and look forward to, to uh, working with you more in the future. It, yes, and I was gonna say pretty much just that, uh, you know, I, I know you're not shy. Uh, Stephanie, I've seen how you come up to Hartford and, and, and Diane and a, a lot of you, Elizabeth uh, and, and uh, Eric. Uh, so you're, you're, you're there you're, and, it's, and it's good when you 
come to Hartford, Carl, with your studies, uh, you know, get, get those to us and uh, any help you could be. We are, by nature, we are open, we are open to what you have to say. So, and, and we will, and every one of our words from every one of us today uh, shows that we will um, step up for you. So uh, again, be, you know, we stay involved. I love this collaborative. It's really good. I, I, I spoke earlier about staying together and trying to get um, that kind of aid to us. Thank you. If I can just jump in quickly and say, look, you know, we had a great bipartisan conversation today on this important topic. And I think that the more information that we have to bring back to our colleagues in the General Assembly will be very helpful. And the recommendation I would have is, you know, instead of having this conversation, you know, right before an election every two years, perhaps we should meet quarterly like this. Um, so, you know, we can learn what some of your struggles are and how we could best advocate for you going forward. But that aside, again, thanks for inviting me. This was a, a fun conversation. I enjoyed being here with all of my colleagues. Any, anybody else, um, Senator Logan or Michelle? Sure, am I off, uh, see. yes. So I, mean, I, I would just like to echo that. For me, it's information. I love information. Um, and I will in the chat, uh, give folks my uh, uh, email address and my uh, personal uh, cell phone. Feel free to uh, you know, text me, call me, send me information. Uh, so that I'm aware of kind of you know what you're uh, dealing with or what the issues are, and I love going to events. So also let me know about some uh, neat events that are going on that uh, I shouldn't uh, miss. But you know, for me, it's just I just want to do the best I can to be on the same uh, page and uh, make sure that I have a, a decent sense of the pulse of what's going on uh, with the arts, uh, certainly in my community in the Naugatuck Valley, but in the state uh, as a whole in general uh, as well. Information for me, I love information, send it over to me, whether they're YouTube uh, links, whether it's uh, links to articles, whether it's your own opinion, uh, just get it over to me whenever you can and as, and as often as you like. Thank you. I, I think from what I see in the chat that Michelle Zomer may have had to <laughs> sign off. She said baby Calvin was having a meltdown. <laughs> um, so I think that wraps it up. Um, Steph, did you have anything more on your end? No, I just wanna say thank you all so much for joining us. Um, you know, the arts are so important to all of us and this conversation was great and inspiring. And I do agree, it would be great to do it more often. So thank you so much. And um, please feel free to visit our websites. Um, the Arts and Culture Collaborative website is waterburyregionarts.com. And we'll have, um, we'll keep you up to date through that and please stay in touch. And this recording we're gonna make available too. And Steph, do you wanna share yours? Sure, our website is artsnwct.org and you can get in contact with us anytime. My email is steph at artsnwct.org. I'd love to hear from any of you, thank you. Well, um, thank you very much. Thank you again to Shoreline Arts Alliance and to Eric for um, all the behind the scenes help. Thank you to our candidates. Um, we wish you well with the rest of your campaigns and we'll plan to see you in Hartford and within our regions to make sure that we're all aware of what the arts have to offer. So thank you very, very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you very much. Take care, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.